Hey guys, welcome to Man Time. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Um, normally I'm doing stuff, today I'm just going to be talking about stuff. And this is something I know quite a bit about. One of my subscribers asked me to describe how I go about evaluating a piece of equipment for purchase, uh, specifically a backhoe. So we'll mostly focus on a backhoe, but it pertains to all kinds of other used equipment um, and, and how to purchase and pick out the right one and know you're getting uh, a good deal and all that. So I, uh, I have a bulleted list here, which uh, <laughs> is quite a bit of information, but we'll just start at the top here and, uh, and go on down the line. So first thing you want to do when trying to select a new piece of used equipment is to don't be in a rush. Um, you can set yourself up for success by having time to plan and time to prepare for what kind of equipment you're going to need, uh, what kind of equipment you're going to need in the future, not just right now. Um, so plan out and think about what type of projects you're going to be working on. Are you going to be doing trenching? Are you going to be doing um, you know, clearing land, digging trees, cutting down trees, digging stumps? Uh, moving trees around, are you going to need it to also do things like pull a plow or whatever? Um, so do your research and figure out what kind of uh, equipment is going to work best for you. Uh, okay, next on the list here, do your research. Uh, so what are good machines? What uh, specifically for a backhoe? Case, Ford, um, Caterpillar. I mean, there's a lot of different brands of um, backhoes out there. I would say talk to your neighbors. Uh, if you're like me, you live in the country, you've got a lot of neighbors, and we've all got equipment out here. Um, so two of my neighbors had Ford 555. So I think one had a C and one had an E. Um, so they were pleased with their tractors. Uh, the one with the three-cylinder like this one, he said it was a little underpowered. But, um, you know, you start getting into the four cylinders, the price goes up, and, and so on and so forth. Um, next thing you want to look at is, are spare parts available for the machine? So if you find a case online, and you are thinking about buying that one, um, do you have a case dealer in your area? Can you get those spare parts? First question. If the answer is no, then, you know. So for me... When I selected my 555, I knew I had a Ford Mahindra and Caterpillar dealer uh, right in town, kind of where I work, and I can go and get spare parts for those fairly easily. When I saw this particular machine for sale, I called and uh, said, you know, I've got a Ford 555. Do you have the consumables available? Filters, um, pins, uh, you know, all the different things that are consumable for this to include things like hoses and clutches and even in this case an engine because this machine had uh, a ca catastrophic failure with the engine that's why it was so cheap um, so called the dealership and said you know is there an engine available is there this is there that for other things like tractors um, you're gonna want to ask yourself those same questions um, you know so and then um, you want to narrow your range when you're searching for a piece of equipment based on that criteria. So if you've only got a, a Caterpillar or you've only got a John Deere and you, or, you know, Massey Ferguson or whatever in your area, you want to narrow your search to that type of vehicle and uh, specifically a vehicle where you can actually get some parts for. All right, so know your price range next. Uh, number three on the list here, know your price range. Uh, and no market value. What's new, used, what's available on eBay, Craigslist, Marketplace, and know that used market value. If you can find some comparables around the same amount of hours, um, you know, know how much that is. Um, but like I said, the first one, set yourself up for success. Um, have some money available. So this is kind of all in preparation. So you need to know the market value, then know how much money you're going to actually need to spend to get what you want, right? Um, you don't want to have a person having their uh, piece of equipment listed for a really good price and then try to talk them down. They're just going to say no, you know, whatever. Quit calling me, quit texting me. Um, I've got it at a good price. I've had to do that on some things that I've sold. 
So know the market and if a good machine comes up available that is what you're looking for, parts available in your area, has the things that you want on it, um, you know, have that money ready and don't try to talk them down on the price. If you know it's a good price, don't try to talk them down. Um, on the other hand, how much is it to rent? You know, if you're just doing a quick project, you don't have uh, a place to store it, you don't have land that you're going to be doing all kinds of project with it, um, look at how much it is to rent it. And maybe it's going to be uh, cheaper for you to just rent, do your project, and then, uh, and then you know, take it back. Um, all right, so know how much you have to spend and then how much you're actually going to have to spend, right? Because you're looking at machines uh, about the same hours for used equipment and um, this one right here, I think, well, let, let's just go to an example of machines available in this area. Because I looked around uh, as of today, there's about four machines that are under $5,000. Uh, there's a few machines that are around $15,000. And the hours, like, basically start at 4000 and go up from there. Some not running, so on and so forth. Um, so the ones that aren't running, you've got to plan for the worst. Do I have to replace the engine? Do I have to replace all these hoses? That's how you figure out how much you're going to have to spend, regardless if the price is good. So maybe the $15,000 machine is actually going to be cheaper because it's got lower hours, it actually runs, um, but you'll have to figure those things out when you actually get there. So that comes, uh, <laughs> that brings me to number four, which is do in-depth inspections. Once you find that vehicle, um, backhoe specifically that you want, you've got parts in your area, you've got a dealership in your area, then you need to do an in-depth inspection and go look at that vehicle. So you're going to want to bring some tools, bring a uh, flashlight, you know, just take your little pen light here and uh, be able to look around inside the engine. You're going to want to specifically look at um, things like filters and checking fluids if you can check the differential fluids the transmission fluids and pay attention um, to the filters was there a date written on the filters um, if you see a date written on filters that's telling you that somebody is experienced with uh, mechanic work and they take pride in their vehicles if you find somebody like that start asking them questions right most of these people selling these machines have a history of it. Now if it's something like, oh I just got it, you know, six months ago, did a project with it, and now it's going out the door, eh, start to kind of question that because, you know, and there's no, you know, dates on the filters, things like that. Now, on the other hand, if it's somebody that knows a lot about mechanics and they start telling you, well it was my dad's and he passed it on to me and I've used it on the farm here for six years and I've always kept up with oil changes and I've got spare filters and I've got a spare belt and I've got this and I've got that. That guy is the guy you want to buy the vehicle from. You know, he's been doing the maintenance on it. He knows the vehicle. He's done with it or whatever for whatever reason is getting rid of it. Um, you know, and at that point, start checking the pins. You know, like I'm standing in the bucket of this thing right now and it's solid. Uh, if you can kick that bucket around, same in the back, uh, you know, move that bucket, see what pins are moving, grab the backhoe itself, try to rock that, see if the pins are loose, see if the hydraulic cylinders have bled out, um, you know, that stuff will all be moving around if there's problems with it. Okay, so you've done your in-depth inspection, you've checked, uh, checked the pins, asked about any service that's been done on it. Um, check to see if there's fresh grease on the Zerks, things like that. Of course, check the oil, make sure it's not milky. Um, then you can move on to, let's see here, knowing your skill level. So let's say you find something wrong with it, and now you've got to replace the pins, or you've got to rebuild a hydraulic cylinder. All that stuff takes knowledge of actually how to do that, or maybe watching some of my videos, because I do all that stuff, right? So, um... My hardest things were like wiring issues. Can I fix wiring issues? Uh, you know, most of the time, um, that's why I get older machines. Older machines have less wiring. They're simple. Engineers use the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, stupid. Um, it, the simpler it is, the easier it is to maintain, the easier it is to work on, and the less likely that it's going to break down. Um, 
Okay, so know your skill level. Can you change a clutch? Hydrostatic e-shift. Um, so I had a, a tractor at one point with what was called an uh, e-shift, uh, hydrostatic e-shift or a shuttle shift. And that thing would just give me problems, problems, problems. Because you got this piece of machine, been sitting out 30 years, whatever, uh, and it's electronically controlled clutch? Oh, you got to be kidding me. Oh, it was awful. Massey Ferguson E30. Don't get one of those. They're bad. Uh, just because of the of the E-shift. That's the only thing that little tractor had wrong with it. It was a great tractor other than that. Uh, commercial grade, yellow, you know, but the E-shift just made it garbage. It was unreliable. Um, the shuttle shift and the E-shift uh, and uh, hydrostatic type of transmissions, they make the equipment operate faster, right? You can go from forward to reverse quicker. You don't have to stop. There's no sync in the transmission that you need to worry about. It's all kind of like on the fly. It's like a semi-automatic, but more moving parts, more maintenance, more things that can break, right? So my advice there is keep it simple, buy what you know, and you know you can fix. Um, and, and, you know, if you find that one that's broke down and, you know, you, you've got a dealer in town, they've got a, a remand engine for it, you know, that they can order or whatever, can you actually change that engine? Or are you going to need, you know, help to do that or whatever? Um, all that stuff ties into how much you're going to have to spend for that vehicle and whether or not that backhoe, that vehicle is going to work out for you. Okay, next, uh, my criteria. So my criteria, when I was looking for this vehicle, after I've gone through all that research, I wanted a true clutch, right? Because I had bad experience um, with that E-shift. So it needed to have a clutch. It also... Um, needed to have as few electronics as possible. I didn't want any unnecessary wires running anywhere for all, anything that was possibly wrong with it. This is super simple. Um, you know, wire to uh, the switch from the alternator and from the solenoid to start the engine. And that's basically it. I mean, it's super simple. I added more when I added these lights up here. Um, but that was one of my main criteria, right? So uh, I knew that I could fix an engine. So when I found this one and it had a blown engine, um, it actually had a piston went right through the uh, right through the um, block. The it, it it had jammed itself somehow in the block, and I think it was because it was it just overheated. But yeah, so I needed a, a new short block for this, so I got one, um, and it was like maybe five grand or so. But I had the skills to. Um, or at least the willingness to try to figure out how to change the engine. It was extremely difficult. Um, if you're wondering if you can change an engine in a backhoe, um, the, the engine is part of the frame in this kind of system here. So you've, and you, and you can't take off the loader because the loader's part of the frame. So you've got to take the front axle off and then um, take the engine kind of out of it from there underneath a hoist or something like that. But all right, anyways, enough about the engine and, and how to do that. Uh, a few other of my criteria, I wanted diesel. Um, diesel has really good torque, and um, so I, I wanted a, a diesel engine. I also wanted, um, so this is another part, know what you want and what you can live with. So I wanted four-wheel drive. Now, four-wheel drive backhoes uh, are kind of rare in this area coming up used. And if they do come up and they've got anywhere near 4,000 or under hours, um, typically starting around 20,000. Uh, that was way out of my budget. So I wanted four-wheel drive. I couldn't really afford four-wheel drive, but if I found something good, I mean, that's really what I wanted, but I would settle for the two-wheel drive as long as it had the big tractor R1 tires on it. So that's another reason why I got this uh, when it came up, even though it had the blown engine. Uh, it had a lot of the things I wanted, and the thing that I would live with if it didn't have four-wheel drive was not to have those stupid R1 tires or um, R4s maybe. Okay, so that is the reason why I got this, ended up getting this vehicle. It had all of the things that I wanted except for the four-wheel drive and it was in the price range where I knew I would come out ahead by changing out the engine. 
um, by changing out the engine. I got this uh, for $2,500. Uh, no, $3,000 and then $500 delivery. So plus another $5,000 for you know a remand engine. So it's going to have new pistons, new rings, um, you know, gone through correct bearings, clearance, tolerance, all that stuff. And I could just drop the head on it. The head was good. Um, they had a coffee can sitting on top of the uh, exhaust, so you know it wasn't getting down in there. I took my flashlight. I looked around in there. Everything was all sealed up. Nobody had messed with it. So that's another important factor. Um, if you see like tools and the hood off and this and that, you know, eh, be a little careful there. So that's how I was able to determine this was the machine for me. I've got spare parts available. Uh, it's got the things that I wanted. Um, the things that I could live with and it was in pretty good shape as far as like the pins and everything the hoses uh, Were a little worn out, but anything you get that's you know in that era of very few electronics uh, Another thing no plastic there isn't a plastic part on this thing um, Except for I think the dash now. I think that's even fiberglass, so I didn't want plastic either but uh, Yeah that is my criteria and how I ended up with uh, this Ford 555 here. This is the straight Ford 555, not A, B, C, D, E. Um, so this was made about 1980, but it still didn't have any plastic and it still had very few electronics, which was absolute musts uh, for me. Okay, so now you've bought uh, your backhoe, let's say. And first thing is, uh, you don't want to be in a rush. Again, <laughs> we started there, we'll end there. Um, it's going to need a lot of things done to it if you're looking for uh, an aero machine like I am that doesn't have all the electronics, has a true clutch, has the bigger tires, all that stuff, um, and, and doesn't have plastic and, and all that. Uh, it, it's going to be an older machine. So there's going to be a lot to do on it. And one of my neighbors um, told me, you know, for this and for other things, uh, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Uh, and I didn't really know that phrasing until he said it to me. I was like, man, I think I've heard that before. But you, you do it one bite at a time, right? So do the things that absolutely need to be done. Uh, change the oil, change the filters. Um, you know, it's going to have a hydraulic filter for the hydraulic system. It's going to have a uh, fuel filter for the diesel. Cha you know, get the water out of the separator. Change the engine oil. Change the air filter. Hopefully it's got more than one. Um, you know, a lot of these industrial pieces of uh, machinery have like a primary and a secondary air filter. Get the manual. Um, you're going to need to go through that, you know, read that right off the bat. Um, and then just, uh, just start using it. You know, once you get everything kind of where it needs to be, start using it, get a feel for it. Uh, you know, if you figure out at some point there that, you know, there's too much slop in this, like with my outriggers, those things just started leaking down immediately within a matter of a few minutes they'd be all the way touching the ground uh, and I lived with that for a long time I just put a chain across the outriggers and you know everything else was fine on it uh, until finally it just like ugh, I can't live with these outriggers touching the ground anymore on me so changed them out um, bu 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 bu. so yeah oh uh, last thing as you're doing the work you're used new used piece of equipment do it right uh, so when I was in there and changed the engine out I changed the clutch and the pressure plate uh, throw out bearing all that stuff um, and you know so you know when you work on the equipment not only you're fixing what's wrong but what can go wrong and you'll have a piece of equipment that you know is reliable it'll work for you you can take it out run it and know that it's not going to break down because you've done everything right uh, up to and including fixed things that were broken. So that's uh, that's the list. I'll have the uh, summary down in the comment area there, and you can check it out if there's anything that you think I missed or some suggestions on uh, on what you went through to get your used piece of equipment and things that helped you. Uh, please comment below and share it with all the uh, the men out there, out there in man time. Thanks for joining me today, guys. Uh, get out there, have you some man time too.